Coming up in this week's episode of TechSnap, have you ever wondered how some of these massive hack attacks actually are pulled off? Well, in this week's episode, we've got details where this attack ended up with 35 million customers' private data getting leaked online. Plus, MySQL has been spreading malware from their website that has been specifically tailored just for your computer, and the details are absolutely amazing. But after all of that, we'll tell you how to set up the ultimate network file server. All that and more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi, everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. It's our Systems Network and Administration podcast. And what that really means is we cover a bunch of really interesting things in technology. And my name is Chris, and joining me on the Skype line for all 25 weeks is Alan. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris. How are hey, you? man. Welcome back to the show. Yeah. I, uh, I feel good. I'm, go- I'm glad to be back because uh, I got home last night. I'm, I'm kind of proud of this, to tell you the truth. I, uh, I scheduled a road trip down to Cryptic Studios for the 100th episode of our show, Stoked. Mm-hmm. And uh, we timed this whole thing, this whole road trip with driving both ways, which was a round trip about 1,900 miles. The whole thing was planned around so I could make it right back here in time to do TechSnap because I love doing this show so damn much. We scheduled the whole trip around it, and uh, the timing worked out perfect. We, worked ju- we left just in time to make it back 15 minutes before the faux show needed to go live uh, and got her live, and then I yep. crashed for the evening, and I'm ready to go for TechSnap. So yeah. I'm excited to be here. That uh, was... I should- you know, some good timing there, honestly. Thank you. Yeah, I'm kind of proud of it. I'm kind of proud of it. Mm-hmm. I should mention, I, uh, I apologize. This is our 25th episode, and it was shot live on September 29th for release on September 30th, 2011. And uh, a lot of the news and stories, especially in the roundup this week, are powered by our awesome Reddit page, which you can find at links.techsnap.tv. And I encourage you to join up there and uh, submit stories or even vote. You can also submit questions. And uh, people will leave comments, and uh, maybe it can even solve your, an- uh, your question before uh, we get a chance to answer it. And yep. it's, been, it's been such a hit that I, I think we're going to launch one for last in the next episode of the Linux Action Show. So yeah, check that cool. out. Links.techsnap.tv. And that is, uh, you guys, thank you so much. You guys are finding great information out there, and you bring great conversation, and it really helps us sort of frame and focus the show. So Right, because not only are you, are you, you know, telling us about the story, which is important for us to include it, but giving us your side of it and what you think of it. Yeah. And we get that from a couple of people, and it makes it easier to see, well, what angle of this do they want to hear about? Right. Or, you know, bring up some point that I wouldn't have thought of. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, our perspective isn't always the same as theirs. Absolutely. Yep, that's totally true. And uh, we have, uh, okay, it's coming up in the show, we've got TechSnap works like this. We usually do some really interesting news stories. And we, we chew on those for a while and give you maybe the bits that you haven't heard from any of the other places you might catch your news. We kind of pride ourselves on that. And then in the feedback section, we're continuing our home server questions. And we've got a good one for you. And then we'll do the roundup. So, Alan, I think yep. with all of that, it's time to jump into the news. What do you say? Yes. All right. Let's talk about this first one because it potentially affects millions of South Korean telecom users, right? It's well, yes. Hack. I think uh, the statistic I heard is there's only about 50 million people that live in South Korea. And this compromise affected 35 million of them. Wow. So what happened? Uh, because uh, I think it's like the government-run uh, telecom, right? Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, it's a... Oh. Yeah. So it's the biggest telecom company in the country, obviously. Yeah. And it looks like, I think the number is, is possibly uh, 35 million accounts have been yeah. compromised. What's the details right. here? Yeah. So sometime between July 18th and 25th, uh, South Korea telecom systems were compromised and all of their customer records which is about 35 million customers, were compromised. Wow. Now, uh, we talked a little bit about this in a previous episode, but in South Korea, they have this real name legislation. Right. Where, right. For websites and stuff. So this database didn't have just the basic subscriber information. It had their username, password, their national ID number, which oh, is kind man. of like a social insurance number, but even uh, more. Or social security number. So in Canada, it's called social insurance right, number. Right. <laughs> Sorry. I couldn't remember which one was which. I was which translating uh, Canadian yep. for you. Yeah. Uh, so it has their national ID number, which is like that, but even stronger and like tied to everything. Oh, man. Uh, their name, their address, their mobile phone number, and their email address. Wow. So it's they basically quite a bit of have... Inc- now, apparently the password everything. and national ID number were encrypted. Now, if the password is encrypted, that's bad. It should have been hashed, which is one-way encryption, but sometimes reporters don't know the difference and report it incorrectly. Right, right. So it's not always clear whether they meant encrypted or they just said encrypted because people wouldn't know what hash meant. Likely. Yeah. Likely. Yeah. 
Um, do they have an idea of maybe who the attackers were? Because this is, looks well, like, from the details, pretty serious. Yeah. Now, the IPs that the attack was launched from were in China, but that doesn't actually mean anything. Mm, right. And yeah. It's uh, kind of an easy blame. Yeah. And now it could have been surrogates on behalf of North Korea, or, you know, it could have been many different things. Well, one of the things I think we find interesting in this attack that we have covered in a lot of the major breaches that we've covered in TechSnap mm -hmm. have had a common thread, like the Sony one. Yep. And the RSA one, they, there's a persistent threat where somebody got yep. access for a long time. Right. It's in, specifically in this case, uh, it was classified as an advanced persistent threat because the attacker managed to compromise about 60 different computers in the company. And they bided their time and just waited and worked away until they managed to get credentials that got them into yep. the database. Yep. And, you know, I know I've said it before on the show, but when uh, I spent time as a consultant who was hired to breach networks, that's exactly what I did. It's yep. the exact tactic I took because you always, just, you, if you're patient and you can cover your tracks, there's always an opportunity that lets you escalate your privileges. Right, and, and that's a thing that a lot of things don't consider, is that it's not always going to, like when you break in, it's not always about getting what you want and getting out as quickly as possible. No, not it's if you really want in. It's about remaining covert mm -hmm. and collecting data over a long period of time. Yeah. Uh, specifically, in this case, they weren't able to get into the really secure systems. Uh, so basically, by breaking into maybe even just one computer, uh, they managed to do reconnaissance and learn things about the internal part of the network. Specifically, they found that South Korea Telecom was using a toolkit box uh, called AL Tools, oh. uh, which uh, is from another Korean company called ESTsoft. And so they have this installed on like all their computers, and this program has an auto update mechanism huh and so what they actually managed to do was go and compromise the other company the company that made the tool and hijack their auto update server the company that was hosting the update files right yeah yeah so estsoft the company that makes the tools okay uh coincidentally they also make the virus scanner that uh the south korea telecom uses but that was a separate server and didn't get compromised EST, like ESET? Like, like EST? It might have been. Yeah, it's EST soft, which that might actually be. Is that ESET, ESET software, sure. the makers of non 32? No way. Could that be EST soft? Well, when I Google EST soft, it's a different company from founded in 1992 in North Korea, so I don't think that's right. it. Right, so yeah. yeah. You mean okay. South Korea, right? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, South Korea. <laughs> it's from South There's Korea. There's a difference. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, they look like they specialize in business and enterprise software. So, yep. Right. And they're the makers of the AL Zip. Yep, that's them. Exactly. And so uh, they managed to compromise their servers uh, for the auto update mechanism. And they didn't just replace uh, AL tools with a Trojan. They rewrote the tool, the auto update system, so that it would only infect computers coming from uh, SK Telecom. Oh, so right? by IP or if something, they, right? If they had had, yeah. So if they had infected everybody that used AL tools, they likely would have been discovered sooner. Right. Yeah, totally. And thwarted but they remain covert by only targeting certain computers with the, with the virus. Fascinating. And then once the auto-update mechanism kicked in and updated all the computers at SK Telecom, it then ran the executable uh, for the update and compromised those systems. There is an amazing PDF. Yes, this that PDF has these timelines is, and everything. Yeah, it's got all the details about what actually happened. So it and, looks like they originally got access almost a year ago in 2010. Uh, well, so this is uh, a domain they set up. So you, this oh, persistent see. threat could have been going for a long time. Right. Now, it's not always clear whether some of these domains were just hijacked and like whether they were originally designed specifically for this compromise or what. Hmm. Uh, but if you ever want to know exactly how a breach like this actually works, right? Like you've watched a couple of movies or whatever, and you're wondering <laughs> how realistic was that movie? Right, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's a good one. This, yeah. this uh, document actually describes how they broke in and, and the different things they managed to do. Yeah, they in, talk and about... And it's, it's easy to understand. Uh, like it's, it's, it, it's 24 pages long, so it's actually not as, bit, as long as you might think it is. Right, and it, it, it's not getting into gory details that are going to explode your brain. No. But it actually explains... Like, the reason it's 24 pages is because the number of citations they have for, you know, every, every yeah. claim they make, yep. they have the evidence to back it up. And so you yeah. see, like, the bottom third of every page is, is citations. citations. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a good sign, well, it's, right? It's a, yeah, it's a it's proper well scholarly paper on the, uh, on the facts. 
So uh, who commissioned that, that report? Do you know? Did they say in the story? I'm not sure. I think this might have been the company that was hired by SK uh, Telecom to investigate the, what happened. Okay. That seems I'm not like sure it, yeah. uh, what, or if it's just some security company publishing the paper for right. publicity. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, so the attackers managed to get in by hijacking the auto-update mechanism of some piece of software used by the target. Yeah. And so first they had to find that piece of software, find something that was used by the target. They had to know they used that. Right. So they broke into some computers there and did reconnaissance and then looked at all the software that was there and then started poking all the manufacturers of that and trying to find some way they could get in. Interesting how, you know, when you think about that, how specific that is, right? They had to know yeah, that they were doing that they were auto updater. The, the, the archiver, archive manager, basically AL zip, right. a zip tool. How do they know they use that though? They must have got into one machine first and noticed that it was on every machine. Uh, yeah, you, get in, you do your, inf- your software inventory. You know, the great thing about the Windows registry is it'll happily tell you everything that's installed in a second. Yep. And then you just take that and you get versions and everything and then you go find what vulnerabilities they have documented. Yeah. So wow. I don't think this was an inside job. Uh, no, but that does illustrate but, just how useful it is just to hack a secretary's desktop and yep. just get an in- software inventory. Just how incredibly yep. good that data is right there. Especially with her user rights. Right, we've seen with uh, a lot of companies now going with this policy of having uh, the images that they deploy identically to every computer. Right, right, right. But at the same time, this is also an example of automatic updates, which are, you know, the motto of TechSnap is like, patch your shit. Right, right. right. And so, but in this case, it actually worked against them. Yeah, well. As as the article notes, if they had not been doing their updates, there was a different... uh, uh, exploit that came out in like June or July that they would have got hit with by if they hadn't been updating. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. Yeah, so you still want to be updating, but. Wow. Well, and it seems like the uh, the fault is really at the service that was providing the updates, right? Because they yes. weren't properly verifying it wasn't a bogus file that was getting swapped out. Right. See, uh, when you do the update mechanisms like apt or yum or and right, and they have a GPG like key with them. Yeah. Right. So on on the system on your system. The, the, the secure computer that's getting the updates, yeah. it has the public key of the repository. Right. And so when you fetch the software, it also comes with a signature. Mm-hmm. And you use that public key to verify that signature. Mm-hmm. And so that's what should have been happening with this update software. And apparently it was just not even checking to make sure that yeah. it's legit. They no. just assume, well, we connect to our website. I, not even likely an MD5 sum. No. But wow. in that case, if the MD5 sum was just going to come from the website, it, w- it could have just been altered to match the compromised version. Ah, right? True, and that's yeah. the difference with the, the GPG key being pre-distributed. Right? It's mm-hmm. local, and you know that it's not going to change. But if you have to get the MD5 sum from the same website you get the file from, that doesn't necessarily help you. This speaks to a real problem in corporate IT where you have tools out there, like, like the chat room right now is talking about WSUS. We should mention, you know, we stream TechSnap live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. over at JV Live TV, jvlive.tv. That's 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, if you want to join us, we have a live chat room, and they're always throwing stuff in there while we're talking. Uh, but one of the things they're mentioning is the fact that WSUS has a key infrastructure where they sign, and you can, yep. you can deploy patches to a Windows workstation or a Windows server when the administrator approves it on your network. Yep. But the problem with that infrastructure there is it only really addresses Microsoft product and, and some Microsoft partner products. So you're right. left uh, to your to own. Use, to use WSUS, the installer or the patch that you're doing has to be the Microsoft installer format. Right, the MSI, and it has to yeah. be signed and all that kind of stuff. But it only patches the Microsoft product. So while these people are on the Windows desktop, their IT department may be keeping all of their Microsoft updates fine, but mm-hmm. there's, no, there's no global tool on Windows to update all of the installation software on your machine from the most latest version. You know, I yeah. mean, well, there's tools out there to try to do it, but it's nothing, nothing that works right. Right, like what desktop computer doesn't have Flash, right? Every employee is going to install Flash or something so they can watch YouTube during yeah. their lunch break or whatever. Right, right. Well, there's no automated tool to allow you to easily update Adobe Flash on every computer on your network. No. They just get prompted or you have to go right. around and do it. Yeah, and yeah. so... That's something that really should be addressed because Adobe is a common attack vector. Yeah. Both the PDF software and... But at the same time, it's, it seems to call for some system where every separate application doesn't have their own homegrown auto-updating system. You know, one thing that large corporate, corporate, env- corporate environments will do is... Uh, have you heard of like ThinApp or uh, things like that where you actually virtualize an entire application and you create like a little mini environment? Kind of like 
the PBI system works a little right. bit on PCBSD or, or I suppose jails, right? A little mm-hmm. bit. And, it's yeah. a and then you can just push that out. But yeah, there's nothing really that scales very well. Right. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this story? Uh, the last thing was that the attackers, uh, when they got the compromised data, when they got the data out of the database, uh, they didn't want to just, you know, email it them to themselves or something like that and leave a nice paper trail. So what they did was they uploaded it to a compromised server that they already had. In this case, it was actually a publishing company in Taiwan that they had compromised the server there and they used that to host all their tools. So when they broke into machines inside the company, they went out to this external website to download the tools. <laughs> and you know what that means? That means that somebody's like, excuse us, when the FBI comes knocking or whoever it is and they get tracked back to that company, that company's probably like, we didn't even know we had an issue until you came knocking on our door. Right, and this is the same thing that happened with RSA. Do you remember when RSA got broken to? Right. Uh, what the attackers did was they took the stolen data uploaded it, in this case, to a compromised web server. Now, with the RSA one, what the hackers did is after they, they got the data off the compromised server, they remotely destroyed it. They, like, overwrote the hard drive. Yeah. And, and basically broke the link leading back to them. Right. Smart. Uh, in this case, it, I don't, it doesn't say anything about the fate of the Taiwanese web server, but hmm. it just seems like they managed to go through a couple of waypoints before they got back to them so that they wouldn't it would be rather difficult, if not impossible, to trace it back to who actually performed the attack. Pretty sophisticated. Hmm. Yeah, this wasn't uh, like some of the attacks we see nowadays that are completely automated. Like sometimes we even see a big site like Twit get hit, and because of the or one that we're about to talk about in a, in a little bit right. down, down in uh, the news, yeah, with the lack of sophistication with the attack on Twit, it just seemed like it was an automated a attack against any right. old versions yeah. of Drupal. Right. Some low hanging fruit stuff. Yeah. And with those, you don't see this same pattern. No, this is a ninja attack. This is, this is ninja yeah. hacking here. Yeah. This was specifically targeted. Like this is professional work. Hack. People that yeah. do this for a living. Or, yep. or at least do it for an insane amount of hobby time. I don't know. But yeah. uh, um, What do you think? Uh, should we uh, maybe give a little bad news to the Mac users? Yeah, I think so. All right. So this next story here important is... Important thing uh, they should be aware of. What's that? Oh, the Mac users. Yeah. So important thing that should... Yeah, this next story is uh, for Lion users. Now... Uh, we have Max here at the Jupiter Broadcasting Editing Studio, and uh, yeah, one of them is on Lion, actually. So, all right, Alan, give me the bad news. What's going on with OS X Lion? Uh, the directory services system may expose your hashed password, uh, your hashed password to you. Now, that doesn't sound so bad, but it can be. Right, so, so there's a way, as the user, I could go read that. So that seems like fine. I know my own password. What's the problem with that? Well, any application running as you could do it as well. Right. And if that application is malicious, they could leak that information. And, and you know, of course, anything that... Uh, now, can they only read your own password? Yes, uh, but they can only read okay. the one as the user you're logged in as, unless you're root, and then you can read everybody's. But, at that but point, you don't run as root on OS X. Right. Okay. Right. So, uh, normally with directory services, when you look up a user, you don't get any sensitive information. Sure. However, when you use the search system, uh, because of the way it applies the permissions, it does give you the elevated permissions to the user you are. So you see your, the private information about yourself. Yeah, okay. Which is normally a bad thing, but it does expose your password hash. It's likely completely unintentional. This they is probably, like a new feature, I think. Yeah, or some change that had an unintended side effect. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, in the search results, it will expose your user's uh, password hash. Now, with that information, you could then... Uh, brute force that password. Right? Like, normally you're not authorized to view other people's passwords, but you are authorized to view your own. However, if somebody had, was somehow able to run any code on your system as you, which is who it would run as if they compromised your browser or something, then they could get your password hash and send it off somewhere. Hmm. So it says here, too, that, um, there, that, you know, that mostly you have to have local access, but that's kind of a misnomer, really. Right. You know, because local access is anything that's executing on the system. Right. So if you could exploit something out there that would... So and again, but having a local user's password isn't necessarily that useful. Well, here's the but thing, if though. if they is, have SSH enabled, it is. Well, and, and OS X utilizes sudo, so you just use your yeah. existing password to execute anything as root. Yeah, so, so once if you, you have, have that password, you can execute root man. that happens to be an admin, then you can do everything. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. So, no patch yet, right? And this has been out for a little bit. I think I've heard about this right. like a week ago or so. I don't actually know what password hashing algorithm Max use. No, I don't know either. It doesn't say here I in the article. I would assume but... it's a 
properly salted one. It yeah. Might just be MD5, but I'm not sure. Like salted MD5, but uh, yeah. so so is uh, there a fix users could do or anything like that? What do you think? There is a workaround we'll talk about in a minute. Okay. Uh, but by by with that hash, an attacker could then perform an offline brute force attack by basically just oh a, you know a hashing cracking program, and it would just try every input password until it finds a ha- finds a hash that's the same as the one that you're trying to guess, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, now those attacks have gotten more common and less time consuming uh, because now we have like you know, crazy multi-core systems and cloud computing where you can rent computers and, you know, botnets of computers, but also high-performance GPUs. Right? Oh, like uh, Bitcoin mining. Yes, like my Bitcoin mining rig could easily be converted to do password hashing instead. <laughs> it's kind of uh, it's, it's funny. Yeah, especially considering that right now with Bitcoin's only being worth like $4.75 or whatever, yeah. maybe I'd rather spend, maybe it's more economical to spend my time breaking people's passwords and stealing money instead. So there is a uh, CNET article. Now, d- did you say that the other than just reading it, you can also change it? Yes. Uh, the other thing is that if you're running this local command, it doesn't prompt you uh, for the original password when you use the change password command. So ah. any program that happens to execute on your system can change your password to something else. Oh, man. <laughs> that should never be allowed to happen. No. There's, there's a reason why, even though you're logged in as your user, it prompts for your old password to let you change before you can change your password. So that if you step out for a second to get a coffee, somebody can't walk in and change your password. So I guess, you know, so for this to affect a Lion user, they have to have something that runs as them that would read this or right. make this change. Yes. What do you think would make... Wh- how, I'm just at not grasping time, how that would happen. These attacks uh, would require some kind of exploit that allows the attack to be performed as that user. Right. However, how many times have we talked about Flash exploits, Java exploits, or just browser exploits that allowed this kind of thing to happen? Mm. Right? You know, we had Adobe update last week. I think, though, and I, I believe this exploits. is good, except for Firefox on, on, on Mac OS X. Chrome and Safari run Flash inside a sandbox container. And I think that can't break out of the sandbox, but that's not the case on Firefox. Which Sometimes in- they have managed to break out of that sandbox. I think, and, but, but that doesn't surprise me Not always. At all. But then yeah. also Java doesn't necessarily run in the same kind of sandbox. True. Right? Java's, Java's, a problem. Java's supposed to be in a sandbox, but right. uh, as we'll talk about in just a minute, that doesn't always work. You just need access to the file system. Right. And then, uh, again, there could be an exploit in Safari or Chrome itself which we've seen that before as too as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the current recommended workaround for this is to use the chmod command to make the DSCL, the directory services uh, client command, usable only by root. And okay. then nobody else could be using it. There you go. So that way, that way the regular users can't read it. And you'd have to, use, you'd have to get pseudo privileges first in order to even be able to, to read the file at all. Exactly. And I, that, does, has there been any reports of that breaking anything? I uh, don't think the directory service is used by anything. Uh, so, that, I mean, it seems like Apple could just release a patch to temporarily just do that, run a little script that just does that. Probably, but... I don't understand why they just sit on this stuff sometimes. They, like, they were the last people to update with the DigiNotar uh, uh, mm-hmm. invalid certs. I mean, they're just, they just sit around. And, you know, and there's such a widely deployed user base now, too. It's like, a, if, if, if ever before, there's more Macs being sold and there's more I, iOS devices out there. They really need to step up on this. They do. This is a bad one. I mean, this is like, this is like, uh, you know, well, easy, low hanging fruit. This is the kind of stuff that's going to motivate malware makers to go after your platform because this is super yep. easy to go after. But at the same time, you know, it's there are quite a few preconditions before you can do a successful attack with this. But it's the kind of thing you need to avoid having in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I I know, but really, if you could just get somebody to download an app or something like that, you'd, you'd probably have them. Yeah. Um. Jeez. Any other uh, thoughts on on this story? No, I think that's put it. All right, so uh, speaking of big sites that mm-hmm. uh, sometimes get attacked, MySQL.com, I think maybe you guys have heard of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it uh, had a bad week, and it got uh, turned into a, a site that actually infected its visitors, didn't it? Yes, and this is actually not the first time this year that that has happened. No, and th- I guess it happened semi-recently, but I don't know if we had a chance to talk about it on the show. Uh, I, th- I could have swore we did, but you, I Maybe it was a roundup item or something, notes. yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, maybe. But, uh, so what happened? Anyway, uh, so the front page of MySQL.com was compromised and basically had malicious code injected into it. Wow. Uh, 
in the form of an iframe that connected to uh, a site off-site. And then that site would then uh, analyze your browser and redirect to one of many different exploits oh, to man. compromise your machine. Shady. And most importantly, this required no interaction from the user. So there wasn't something that popped up that you had to say okay to. Just as soon as you visited the page, your machine was compromised. So they did like this custom malware customized for you, like based on your operating system and your browser and all this stuff. Yeah. That's sophisticated. So that's kind of, it, that's it kind of impressive. Like a couple of different Trojans based on, you know, which browser you were using and which OS so that it could hit you. Now, I don't know if they actually had any Trojans that worked for anything other than Windows, but... Yeah. That's usually not the case, but... And uh, the ones that... Uh, there's uh, armorize.com on their blog actually has a video uh, walking through what was happening. Uh, and some and stills, actually, too, some screenshots as well. Yep, of the, of the source code, and then they yeah. deobfuscated it. Yeah. But at the bottom, they actually have a video showing the compromise happening in real time. Oh, wow, really? All right, so we're yep. playing it now for you audio listeners. You know, Alan, we have a surprising amount of people that listen to this show in audio form. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, for probably a bunch of commuters and stuff. So uh, if you're watching the video, you see they have this little program at the bottom uh, on the left side. That's going to show every .exe file that is run or created on the system. Wow, okay. And then it's also going to make a copy of any of those to this box in the lower uh, okay. right corner. So now he's launching up IE. And then he uses uh, Fiddler, which is a HTTP proxy that lets you analyze all the tra traffic back and forth. So he's routing his browser through Fiddler to track it. Yep. Okay. And then now he's going to MySQL.com. Okay. And we see a ton of stuff, ton of hits. Yep. The regular traffic, right? Loading all the images and... Yep. and uh, Pages loading. Uh, yeah. And so you can see in this monitor, he had Fiddler start and his browser start. And Java but, just started in the background, yeah. too. So now Java just started. And you can see the Java pop-up happen. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, without him clicking anything... A bunch of files start boom, showing up. <gasps> a couple of EXEs uh, pop up and get run. Look and his machine go. is now infected with spyware. Wow. And nothing on the page. I'm noticing on the MySQL.com nope. page. No uh, indicator. It's, it's a 10 pixel by 10 pixel iframe with the uh, style sheet set to not visible. Impressive. So it's Impressive. completely invisible, uh, but it's created this little exe, run it, and that downloaded another exe, and the machine is now full of spyware. Wow. And do you know how they were able to comp... I mean, how were they able to get this iframe on the MySQL website? I'm not sure, uh, but basically, they have a, a file of, full of JavaScript, and they managed to just inject a bunch of lines at the top of that. Uh, now, interestingly, in the previous attack, uh, in the news story, there was some talk about the fact that there was a cross-site scripting vulnerability that hadn't been fixed yet. Oh. Now, if that or a very, very similar attack would allow them to basically yes. include remote code into the files at MySQL.com, and that defeats... Normally, browsers have what's called the same origin policy, where code from different sites can't interact, so that a malicious site can't screw with the trusted site. Right. But in this case, if the back-end code in PHP or whatever of MySQL allowed some code from another site to be included so it looked as if it was coming from MySQL.com, that restriction wouldn't apply. I see. Yeah. That's probably so exactly see, what happened. He actually, he's going through the forwarding that happens. Yep. And you can see it passes a bunch of information and goes to this very random URL. Yep, and that where a PHP file sits to run as it gets yep. hit. Mm -hmm. So the so iframe points to the first site and that site makes a decision on which Trojan to send you. That is pretty slick i really yeah. kind of i mean i don't like it because it's no. bad but but it, at the same time if one of those trojans all of a sudden started getting picked up by most virus scanners they could just switch it out for a different one yeah they just change what it's recommending it use yep uh at the same time there were also reports uh a little bit before this was announced that russian hackers were offering to sell admin access to mysql.com for three thousand dollars oh so we might have some suspects then yeah so but specifically they might have compromised more of the site than just a little bit Rather than just using a cross-site scripting vulnerability to inject a little bit of code, they might have actually been able to compromise the entire site and be able to put code wherever they want and take over the admin access of the site. So they're offering... So the price, the price for MySQL.com, which I would think is a pretty big site to sell, was $3,000 mm -hmm. to get yep. access. They, they, that's, what they, that's what the Russian hackers wanted, is $3,000. Yeah. And it, well, because it's not like it would last very long, right? MySQL is going to shut the site down and solve the problem or whatever. Oh, true. Store from true. the back or whatever. Yeah. yeah, that's a good uh, point. But at the same time, you know, 
Yeah. Maybe you want to start your own botnet, or yeah, maybe I mean, you just want to see what's going on at MySQL.com. So that's that's well, that's an interesting point you just made, actually. Without I don't, I mean, I just didn't really think about it, but that's probably things like the hack we talked about at the top of the show. That kind of thing is probably a more valuable thing you would sell because you right. have persistent access. Where something like MySQL, it's sort of like a fire sale, so you sell it at a discount. Well, at the same, if they hadn't put that Trojan on there, then they probably could have, you know, been sneaky about it and got more information or, you know, sold it for a higher price. But at the same, but because they put that Trojan on there, people are going to find out about it and be like, hey, right? Do you have any thoughts on what maybe the MySQL.com server admins could have done to uh, better monitor, to, to, to know that this had happened before people um, started getting effed? Like I was right. trying to think, like, um, what could they have watched? Because there wouldn't be now, much in the logs. Depending on what the site is, the code for this, like this, the JavaScript files and so on could be read-only. Right? Yeah. And you could have something like Snort set up to tell you if any of the files are modified. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And you would well, know when you do an update up, to the website. What about serving up like a flat cached version of the site instead of serving up the live actual yep. scripted files? That, that know, can happen as well. Yeah. But it seems like they had some back-end code somewhere that was generating the output files and mm -hmm. had some bug in it that allowed uh, remote code to be included as if it was local code. Wow. And that, you can see that, you see that happen a lot with amateur PHP code. Now, yeah, yeah. I don't know even what the MySQL.com site's built in. Uh, in. In this well, case, it could have been that Oracle's using some giant enterprise CMS that got compromised. Their, uh, their cross-scripting code was using PHP, and so I, it's, I, yeah. I think it's, it, lo it, looks like, it looks like it's probably just some sort but of CMS. It, it's also funny to see Oracle's MySQL.com got hacked, and then what did they put on it? A Oracle Java exploit. <laughs> that is funny. That's a little salt in the wound, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, they did. I <laughs> good catch, Alan. All right. Well, any other thoughts on this well, story? Those this didn't originally, but those were all separate companies. But then Sun bought up Java yep. or Sun had Java, yeah. and then uh, or, they bought then Sun bought MySQL, and then yeah. Oracle bought both of those. And yeah, now they got yeah. Now um, you got multiple vulnerabilities from Oracle. The number, number one sign you're a large corporate uh, entity is that uh, your own software is used to hack your other software. That's yeah. a that's a pretty big that's a good sign of that. Any other thoughts on this story? Um, no, I think that's about it. Yeah? All right, then you know what that means. It's time for the TechSnap Feedback. All right, Alan, it is time for the TechSnap Feedback segment. Of course, that's what that awesome music is. And again, thank you for powering our Reddit page and emailing in your suggestions. This episode, we're continuing a story arc. You know, if you're like a Star Trek uh, Enterprise viewer from season three, remember the Zindi story arc where they did like one big long. Well, never mind. You probably don't like Enterprise. I apologize. But we're doing that with home servers. We've been doing the ultimate lineup. We've covered firewalls and RAID, and now we're going to talk about file services and file sharing for your home network. But Alan, before we jump into that, we should probably talk about the different types of file sharing you could do, right? Because there's a couple of options, a few right. options. Right. Uh, and so we'll talk about uh, solutions for Linux and BSD, but also Windows, and then also one that's more set it and forget it kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, something that if like some a of this stuff makes, solution. Yeah, if it makes your eyes gloss over what we're about to talk about, uh, we'll, we'll, we have a solution. There's an for option you. for you at the end. Now, I think uh, people are familiar with a lot of different stuff, but do you want to maybe talk about the differences between some of them? And some of them right. have fundamental differences, like FTP versus a Samba file mount, things like that. Right. So with the most popular ones, like SMB, also known as Samba, which is the Windows file sharing system, and NFS, the network file system, which is the common for Unix. Uh, with both of those, you're basically mounting a remote drive uh, as, almost as if it were local. So it means you can use the files interactively. Yeah. yeah right? like, so you can, like if it's an Excel doc on the share, you can open it up, work on it, and save it and close it, and it's on that remote server. Mm -hmm. uh, with things like FTP and uh, SCP that we'll talk about, with those, you're making a copy of the file locally and working on it. Yeah, so you, you open you the want, connection and you pull it yeah. down. And if you want that copy to go back to the server, you have to manually copy it back. And overwrite. Yeah. Uh, so it depends what you're doing, whether, which one makes more sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, with uh, Samba and NFS, you're getting all the features. Uh, but at the same time, they're more work to set up. Yeah, there's a lot of more overhead to get Samba as a server running. So if you're yeah. not comfortable with that, that could be a barrier to entry, whereas FTP can be pretty quick. Yeah. Especially with things like FileZilla and the yes. FileZilla server. Yep. Yeah. Right. So if you're doing a Linux or FreeBSD, uh, yeah. 
and you want to be able to allow your Windows machines to see your Linux server as if it was just another machine on your Windows network, then you want to install Samba. Yeah, and we're going to cover that in Linux Action Show and how to do yeah. that really easily under Linux. So we'll probably save most of that. Yeah, um, uh, but basically what that'll do is let you define your shares and share certain directories yeah. from your Linux machine as if they were directories on a Windows machine. Yeah, so, and Linux machines and Windows machines can see that. Yeah, and it can also get more complicated. Samba can also allow your Linux server to join a Windows Active Directory domain and Ooh all boy. kinds of crazy things. Oh boy, yeehaw, <laughs> or act as a domain controller, as yes. the case may be, yeah. Done that a few That's times. really complicated, but yes. What about using uh, SSH? I mean, we all know SSH is the tool you use to log in and do remote commands from the right. command line. And uh, with SSH, you can tunnel the copy command. And so that's actually called SCP, secure copy. Uh, and there's also SFTP, which is, uh, it's not actually FTP, but it's meant to work kind of like it. And uh, that works very well as well. Uh, so that's encrypted, so that's better, uh, but it uses slightly more CPU because it's encrypted. Right. And if you're just on your LAN, then you might not need the encryption, and you might want the little bit extra speed. But most times, your limiting factor is going to be the speeds of your hard drive or the speed of your network. The one right? advantage to it, though, 100 is... 100 megabit or wireless, then you're limited by that. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I the one advantage to uh, SCP is, is that if you're already running, already running SSH, like on your it's Mac already set or up. desktop, uh, Unix or Linux desktop, it's already running, you only have to run yeah. one service. Exactly. SSH is already set up. You already have usernames and passwords. It's all ready to go. And you, you don't have to do anything. Secure. Right. Exactly. With FTP, if it's not already set up, then you have to configure it, and you have to worry about accounts. You have to worry about people trying to break into it. Uh, the downside to FTP is it's not encrypted. So anybody running Wireshark or sniffing your packets would see the username and password when they went across. Again, might not be a big deal on your home network. Right. right? Unless you have an open Wi-Fi access point or something yes. like that. And things like that. Uh, there's also FTPS, which is FTP over SSL, uh, which solves that problem. But that's not supported by very many clients. And probably not something you're going to want to set up at home. No. Because uh, that involves either becoming your own certificate authority or getting a SSL certificate. Right. <laughs> but it is pretty much the fastest uh, way to transfer files, mm. like speed-wise. Yeah. Like I've noticed that using Samba across my LAN, I top out at about 30 megabytes per second. Right. But using FTP, I get up to 60. Well, now that's an inefficiency, too, in the Windows Samba client, because yes. uh, two, Samba, two Samba machines from the actual open source Samba project talking to each other will actually a get better speed. Yeah, yeah. But there's more overhead in that protocol than there is with FTP, yeah. which is just raw TCP. Right. And so there is, uh, it is the fastest way to transfer files. However, the, one of the problems with FTP is when it was invented, no one had thought of NAT yet. And so part of the protocol actually involves sending the IP address in the message. And so when you're behind NAT and you have an internal IP address, right. it gets all kinds of screwy. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't recommend FTP, but if you're just inside your LAN and you want the fastest one, it is fast and easy. Like if you had, like, yeah, if you had CD images or movie files and you just want to move them between machines, that's probably it. But again, they're not persistent connections either. Right. What about something like NFS that, where you could mount like yeah. a persistent connection? Yes, and you can do that. Uh, NFS works uh, extremely well between Linux machines. Uh, and there's also some NFS clients and even servers for Windows, but uh, the servers for Windows usually cost money. Now, NFS is pretty low overhead, and it almost yeah. just feels like once you set it, it just worked. It's almost like yes. as reliable as a physical connection to a hard drive. It's really yeah. solid. And uh, one of the things is, depending on the mode, NFS will actually operate over UDP and do its own checking. Because your LAN is so reliable, it can dispense with some of the overhead of TCP and give you uh, better speed and lower latency. Oh, I, uh, Aimless in the chat room mentions that uh, NFS is available on Macs, too, for file sharing. Yeah. Oh, did not know that. Cool. Uh, and then one of the other options with Unix is rsync. Oh, yes. Uh, which was originally designed for keeping mirrors of source code or websites or whatever up to date. Uh, so what it allows you to do is transfer the differences between files. So if you've already downloaded a file uh, from the server, but then the server updates their file, you don't have to download the entire file again. You can download just the differences. Unison also, Jungle Boogie wants us to make a plug for Unison, which can, uh, can do some of that. Now, the nice thing about rsync is it's a perfect tool for backups. Because like what you yes. just mentioned, if it only moves the changes. That's a great tool. Like if you just want to have a box running in your home and, a, and something on your desktop. And rsync's available for Windows as well. Yep. And, and you can just have it run and just move the changes. Uh, Microsoft has a tool called uh, SyncToy. And, uh, and, and also RoboCopy are tools that are similar that can kind of do this. But... Nothing compares to rsync. Uh, rsync is made by the Samba project too, I believe. So 
Yeah, or maintained that, now, anyway. Oh, okay, it was originally okay. made by them, but yes, it is maintained by them now. Okay, maintained by them. Um, I, I think probably rsync, you know, because it's, it is kind of a command line approach, it's probably better, like, if you wanted to make a backup script and then set it, it's yeah, probably it's, not good to just move files around, like MP3s right. or something like that. Yeah. What do you think about, now you have a mention in here for iSCSI. Now that's hardcore. Yes. Now, if you're going to be doing something like we were talking about uh, between segments of doing uh, virtual machines, uh, by using iSCSI, it, they're popular for virtual machines because it removes one of those layers of abstraction. Right. Right. With your regular virtual box setup, you have the virtual box has a virtual hard drive that then actually points to a file on your file system, which then goes to your actual hard drive. Mm hmm. Right. So there's quite a few layers in there. And each one of those adds a little bit of overhead and slows it down and causes problems. With iSCSI, you're actually linking to a specific segment of a physical device. And so you get rid Over of... Over the network. Yeah. And so you get rid of all but one of the layers of abstraction. It's, 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 it is the iSCSI, it's the SCSI protocol over Ethernet. It's so yeah. you, there's, there's, a, there's a mount SCSI, there's an iSCSI mounter client and there's an iSCSI server. And when those two yeah. connect to each other, the server gives that client direct you know, access to a physical, like a partition on the hard yeah. drive kind of thing. Exactly. And, and, uh, they, although they have weird naming. The, uh, the client is called the initiator right. and the hard drive is called the target. Right, right. <laughs> and, uh, and one of the things we're going to talk about, FreeNAS, which is our, our, our turnkey solution here we'll mention in a minute, is uh, can just easy, do that. easy iSCSI. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, doing it yourself is hard. iSCSI is a great thing if you have a, mach if you have a machine like, um, for example, like an iMac or a laptop. Oh, great for a laptop where you can't mm -hmm. really add a bunch of storage to it, but uh, you need to have like, SCSI, or, like direct attached storage for whatever yep. you're doing. iSCSI is a great way to go. Yep. But it's under Windows. I don't know of a way to do it, at least um, the server part of it. You have Windows has the connector, the, the initiator. Yeah, the piece. initiator is built into Windows, but in only know, newer versions and I, only the server versions. If you're connecting but. to like an open file or a free NAS box, then you know, they can act as an iSCSI uh, target. And yeah. then from your desktop, you could actually use iSCSI to mount drives on your, on your file server. That's but pretty intense. As far as being a server, it's not really, there's no option because an application running on top of Windows wouldn't have access to the physical hardware to do that. Should we talk a little bit about maybe what the Windows options are for file sharing? Yeah. Uh, so the easiest option for Windows if, uh, is obviously Samba, right? The built-in Windows file yeah, sharing. Yeah, you just got to turn it on. Yeah. It's like a checkbox uh, in, in Windows 7. But also there's a very simple one, uh, FileZilla, which is a, a client program. People love FileZilla, Alan. Yeah, it's what I use on my Windows machine. And it can do all the different protocols. FTP, FTPS, um, what else do they have? Uh, SSH, SFTP, uh, SCP, all the different ones you can think of. I wish they would do, um, I wish they would do Amazon S3. They won't yeah, do it. I talked to them about it and they won't do it because it's proprietary. Uh, and it's complicated and yeah. changing all the time. And, Another... Uh, I want to give another mention to an open source one that's kind of a newcomer on the Windows platform, and it's because uh, it, it used to be a Mac exclusive, and it does support S3, and that's called uh, CyberDuck. And mm -hmm. CyberDuck is a really nice little. Uh, again, it does it does WebDAV. It'll do uh, it'll do rack space cloud files. It can even transfer in, in and out of Google Docs, and it will do um, mm -hmm. SFTP and uh, SCP. And it's free. It's open source. You can, they, That's a they, lot of uh, cool stuff. Yeah, they ask for donations, but it's totally free, and, and now they have a version available for Windows yeah. or the Mac. Linux users are out, but honestly, yeah. the Linux users, um, like all of the built-in file managers that are popular, have all these protocols baked right in. So right. like in Nautilus, you can just type in smb colon slash slash and the address of your yep. Windows machine, and it'll, if you have file sharing turned on, it'll connect. Yeah, and same with SSH and so on. And yeah. uh, FileZilla, the client, is available cross-platform. Uh, Windows, Linux, and Mac, right? Is the server only Windows, though? The, file the server only? is Windows only. Yeah, okay. Of course, if you're on Linux, there's lots of FTP servers already, so it wasn't worth their time to make FileZilla server for Yeah, that's Linux. fair, I guess. That's uh, fair. And it only supports FTP and FTPS. It doesn't support uh, any of the SSH-based ones. Mm, okay. Okay. Now, uh, probably, yeah, because... Because all of your remote systems are generally going to support the Windows Samba file service, probably just turning on SMB on Windows would be the easiest. the easiest way. But if you want an FTP server, because it's faster and easier, it is fairly, it's quite easy to set up with FileZilla server. And honestly, though, it, something to consider. If you are starting from scratch and you, you really are a Windows user and you know, you're, that's kind of your ecosystem and you want a server, maybe look into one of those Windows home servers yep. that, that are out there because those are 
little, uh, I think the latest ones are based on server 2008, and, um, you know, it, it's just a little dedicated box that can do that for you. You can do it on your desktop, but then you have to have your desktop running all the time. Right. Um, I'm not a huge fan of, I'm, I'm biased against using Windows as your main server. Right. Now, uh, a lot of my students, when I used to teach, would have this because we, they have Windows admin classes where they would have to set up a domain, so they would actually have a little server with a domain at their house for, or even maybe it was just a virtual machine, but some of them had a physical machine where they'd be running Windows Server 2008 or whatever because uh, Microsoft gave uh, free licenses to all of our students. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, for, they like to like, do that. Server 2008. Yeah. And uh, because they want them to get used to it and want to use it in the future. <laughs> now, uh, uh, and so it made sense to talk about that kind of thing sometimes. The, um, now, you want any other thing you want to touch on Windows or should we move uh, on to? There are some NFS servers for Windows, but most of them aren't free. Uh, there's NFS clients, uh, yeah. but they never work as well. Honestly, if you want, if you have Windows and Linux, you're better off using Samba than trying to do NFS. Uh, but if you already have your NFS set up and working, maybe it's worth it to go that route instead of trying to switch everything over to Samba. Now, why don't we stay on the topic of Windows Home Server and FreeNAS? Because I think we should talk a little bit about FreeNAS, and uh, we have a link in the show notes to. Uh, it's kind of embarrassing, so go easy on me. But it's an old video I did, and a little bit of trivia. It's uh, the video shot in the studio before I built it, and I compared FreeNAS to uh, the uh, HP uh, home server stuff um, about 40 pounds ago. And uh, it, uh, it was actually a pretty popular video. A video had 120,000 views on it. And nice. if you're curious like how a Windows file server would stack up against something like FreeNAS, it's a little old now. It, it was in January of 2009. But, uh, right, so that was an older version of FreeNAS that yeah, didn't support ZFS. Yeah. But, still, but still a good version of FreeNAS. So if you're curious yep. how a Windows file server versus FreeNAS might stack up, that's something to check out. Also, mm -hmm. because you know, we're covering a lot of stuff, I'll give, a, I'll give a mention to a video where I went into depth on what FreeNAS is and how it works and why you might want to look at it. Again, a little older. This was in, I did a series on FreeNAS, and uh, this is from my home office and uh, before we had a studio and before we had 16 by 9 cameras and uh, talk a little bit about what FreeNAS is. But uh, because that is a little out of date, there's probably plenty we could say here. Do you have any, any particular... Are you, have you used FreeNAS much? Have you uh, not you really, actually. <laughs> well, it's right, up your, it's right up your alley because it's yes. uh, BSD-based. You're right. Uh, but honestly, I already have a machine running for BSD, so I would just add the services I wanted right. to it rather right. than building a dedicated machine. Yeah. Uh, but yes, it's very easy, especially if you don't want to have to set everything up yourself. Uh, yeah, that, it has a very convenient web interface. Very nice it web does, interface. Uh, Samba, NFS, FTP, SFTP, iSCSI, and way more protocols than I can all name off the top of my head, all out of the box, ready to go. And it supports data snapshots, and of course you can do backup yep. regimens on it. Yes, it now, and because it has the ZFS in it now, it can do all kinds of interesting things. It has support for 10 gigabit Ethernet drivers. Mm -hmm. if, like, if you're going to use this in a corporation and you're going to have a whole bunch of 1 gigabit servers running off of it, you're going to need the 10 gigabit trunk to push the data out to all of them at a high yeah. enough speed. The uh, FreeNAS interface makes setting up things like data raid and file shares and joining Windows domains just... Well, actually, I think they just took that one out, but it's coming soon. It, it, it makes all of that stuff just clicks away. Yeah. Uh, and, and you'll be surprised but that you it, can take... it doesn't take away the command line interface. You can right. still get a command line if you want it. Yep. Which and is something I always like, right? Make it easy, but don't take away my power tools. And as Project, Project Morris is in the chat room, is it's fast as frack. And it really yep. is. It's a very fast little thing. And you can put it on a low-end system or a high-end system. And it has mm -hmm. support for a ton of RAID controllers or just standard yep. SATA uh, controllers. For ZFS, you need a slightly higher-end system, especially in how much RAM it has. Ah. But you can use the regular UFS uh, with no issue on a, a lower-end machine. So, uh, you know, I... I, the reliability is just is bar none with FreeNAS, and the features sure. are, are simple and easy to use and powerful. They're real enterprise-grade features that you just yes. get checkboxes to use. Yeah, so, it's because you know, FreeNAS is actually used by enterprises, and so you, you know, if they can trust it, so can you. I think, I mean, I think I'm comfortable saying, I also, I also put a link in there for a FreeNAS versus the Drobo, which is also kind of old, but the Drobo is a, is a product that I'm kind of a fan of because it's, it's unlimited upgrade. You know, you can put mismatch yep. drives in there and then the RAID automatically will let you expand and you just pull one out and you can add a two terabyte drive one week and a three terabyte drive the next week and it just grows across the array. Yep. Um, but it, it has some downsides to FreeNAS too. So, right. in fact, like it's $800 just for the chassis, for example. Mm -hmm. With FreeNAS, you just throw on a box you have or in a VM. What do you think about that? Yeah. A virtual uh, box. Now, it not, if you want to play with it, a VM is great. If you want to actually deploy it, the VM is usually not the best because... Again, all those layers of abstraction in the file system are going to make the main, its main job is to serve files as fast as possible. Yeah. And if you're abstracting that, 
And at the same time, it's not going to have that much storage, likely, right? If it's in a virtual machine, you you have less storage than you would have if it was if it was the host. Right. You could do it to play with it, and it's definitely worth at least doing. But that. It's, if you were going to roll your own version, something like FreeNAS, you could put VirtualBox on top of it and run virtual machines on the machine. Yeah, that would be cool. That would be that would be you know, a great little perk to having your home servers. Also, have it run a but, few extra. Virtual and that was the thing we were talking about. If you're going to have more than one machine doing virtual machines, uh, if you want the ability to seamlessly move a virtual machine from one host to another, you have to be using iSCSI because the storage has to be off of the host machine. Uh, Tuxi in the chat was asking about what about FreeNAS versus Amahi. Now Amahi is more focused on media delivery and stuff like that. Though FreeNAS does offer. DNLA streaming and, and things like that. And it even iTunes has uh, like iTunes integration. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that uses Firefly or whatever that open source iTunes backend is. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a great little box. So I, 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 I think I really recommend as the, the ultimate uh, home file server if you want to just build yeah. something and throw it together. It's a great way to go. But check the show notes, everyone. Alan, you put yes. a bunch of great bullet points in there of things you could do depending on what operating system you want to use and different things yeah. to look at. And, and including uh, a little talk about SideWin and how you could get almost all the Unix features you want on Windows. That's Although a, it's not the best way to do it, and but it's free. Really, just have a Linux box, but it is free and it works yeah. if you're in desperate need of you know being able to run our, an rsync server off a Windows machine for whatever reason. I've been in that position before, so I, exactly that's a good link. Um, Sometimes and then, you don't get to pick uh, what you have to work with. Right, you just yeah, you have to make it work. And if you know, it's if, if in my case that Windows machine was the one odd out man, and it couldn't be involved in the whole backup you know regime that we had set up if it couldn't do rsync and SIG wouldn't you exactly. know save the day. Um, yeah. All right, and of course, we're going to talk more about uh, getting uh, file sharing working on a Linux box in the Linux Action Show this week, so tune in for that yes, if you want to get more on that. If you want to see all about the... Uh, yeah, doing it on the setting Linux Setting up side. Samba. Then so, setting up Samba, and, and honestly, yep. it's going to be just a couple of clicks to really do it. I think you guys will be surprised yep. how easy yeah, it is. Yeah, we'll, we'll show you the, uh, the SWAT web interface and uh, a yeah. bunch of cool stuff. Yeah. All right, Alan. Well, you know what that means. It's time for the TechSnap Roundup. And that music means it's roundup time. And uh, the roundup is always stories that didn't quite qualify to get like in the main meaty stuff that we chew on, but we still wanted to cover in the show. And always ones that were voted up in our Reddit uh, page also yes. tend to make it in here. Now, I'll take the first one in the roundup this week because it's kind of a uh, follow-up. Well, it is a follow-up from the story last week. And mm -hmm. that is uh, the guys at Mozilla are talking about blocking the Java framework in order to stop that beast exploit that we talked about where if you're a man in the middle, you can say sniff somebody's cookies even if there's SSL, even if it's from an SSL session, say like somebody's PayPal cookie. Yeah. And uh, so I guess that was an exploit of the Java framework, and that's why Mozilla right. wants to block and it. Right. And actually, so is the the MySQL attack we saw. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. And you know, Java's not used all that much anymore. Although a lot of corporate apps use uh, yes. Java because yes. a lot of them were written in Java and they just kind of uh, extended onto the web as an applet. Yeah. And it's especially it because. Apps that were built a couple of years ago, HTML and like JavaScript were really not up to building right. a web app a couple right. of years ago. Right. And so they, they had to build it in a framework like that. Uh, so I don't know that it's such a good idea. But at the same time, if you don't need Java, you probably maybe want to disable that plugin. I agree. Yeah. I say turn it off and see what happens without it. Maybe things will be better. Maybe your pages will yeah. load faster. Now, this next story in the roundup is a, kind of a bit of a shocker. Uh, uh, it depends. Okay, all right. Yeah, if you understand the background, it's not that big. All right, well, so the NSA wants its very own smartphone. Right. Now, what now, do you think, Alan? The NSA is, its job in the U.S. government is to provide all cryptographic systems used by the government. Oh, uh, okay. That makes sense. Right. So they're in charge of, you know, deciding what the standard encryption will be or how you encrypt classified information and all that. So they basically want to build a smartphone uh, that would allow, you know, certain people to have access to classified data on a platform that would be secure hmm. uh, and but also i don't know if uh, people remember but uh when obama was first elected there was a big uproar about he wanted to keep his cell phone yes yeah, blackberry right yeah yeah and you know it uh because it was a blackberry it has at least some security settings but if he had an iphone they would have probably taken it away from him <laughs> <laughs> now here's an interesting kind of uh side note uh, we, we won't get political here on you folks but yep. just just kind of fills in a bit of background is uh there is a, a bill that Obama wants passed by Congress that is sort of like get America back to work. And he's been going around saying, pass this bill, you know, pass this bill. We need Congress to pass this jobs bill. And in that jobs bill, bill is a provision about creating a private, secure, federal cell network across the United States. And um, so it'd be interesting to see this private, secure, federal communications network 
in conjunction with the smartphone where right. they have their own network and their own phone. I mean, that could be a pretty secure, pretty tight loop there. Um, one mm -hmm. of the things that's interesting about that uh, provision, by the way, is uh, they're also allowed to partner with commercial entities like, so, oh, I don't know, AT&T, and they can say, if they have coverage in that area, just make it so that that way, if the federal people need to make a call, it can bump the regular old consumer off, which, mm -hmm. you know, in a state of emergency, that kind of makes sense, but so right, it's interesting. Right, because we saw, you know, during an emergency, cell networks get overloaded, exactly. and they crumble. And, and, you know, lonely civilians don't need to worry about making calls, I guess. But it is interesting to see the complete package here, because that was a separate story that was unrelated, but now you can kind of see how they're really trying to address this issue, because there are a lot of insecurities in our in our telephones and our yep. in our cell networks. All right, Alan. But specifically, you know, if if you're gonna have you know high level government people with access to secret information, they need a cell phone that maybe isn't logging everywhere they've ever been on the GPS. That would be nice. And yeah, you know, yeah. a bunch of information like a bunch of settings and and basically enforceable right. encryption. Well, and and it came out yesterday that uh, uh, cell networks like uh, Verizon and store your location to which towers you ping, and so does AT&T indefinitely store, store the location, that just the towers you ping to. And if mm -hmm. somebody were to compromise that to get a government, they could get a, some government agent's location, yep. you know, and, and maybe take somebody out based on where they're pinging. So right. if they so have a separate secure network, they're not as vulnerable if, if those other compromises. This isn't, you know, happen. all spy stuff, really, though. Right. A lot of it can be just, you know, government officials need a secure platform yeah. to access data from. And they need but at something the same time, that they can they, have confidential you know, communications on. Yeah. Yeah. Next story in the roundup? Yep. All right, so this next one's more bad news for the Mac users. Uh, there's a Trojan that hides inside malicious PDF files. Uh-oh, this could be a good way to exploit that password vulnerability, couldn't it? Yep. You know, what's interesting is if uh, people might remember there was a website you could go to to hack your iOS device and root it just by going visiting the website and saying, I agree, and that used a PDF exploit to do. Mm -hmm. So PDF exploits seem to be the bane of uh, the Mac desktop. Funny how I, that's uh, both made, both Flash and uh, PDF, they're Adobe yeah. products. Hmm. Uh, all right, next story is this IBM one, Alan. You want to take it? Yes. Uh, so IBM has just uh, got a patent, or is trying to get a patent, on a GPS that purposely takes you the least, or not the least, uh, purposely the takes you route. a, a, well, not the longest route, but a route that isn't the shortest. Okay, a longer uh, route. Yeah. Basically, uh, the way they envision it is uh, the supermarket would pay IBM a fee and for that fee, IBM would make your GPS take the route that makes you drive by the grocery store. So it's like sponsored, sponsored GPS navigation. Yeah. <laughs> right. What so, about gas? So, I mean, that's going to cost me gas money. Well, uh, and time. To try to be to try to be green about it, uh, they applied for a second patent where they would charge the store extra if it made you use more gas because that was bad for the environment. What the? There's no, there's nothing in there about paying you for the gas yeah. that you wasted, but they are going to charge the company extra because of the harm to the environment by making you drive extra. Maybe uh, maybe IBM's just getting ready for the new carbon tax is probably around the corner, and they need to save right. up so they can pay on that. Interesting. Um, I hope now, IBM it, uh, doesn't implement this. <laughs> right. Like we talked a little bit about it last night. We were saying that you know, if this meant that you got your GPS unit for free, maybe it'd be yeah. moderately useful. Yeah. But at the same time. Everybody's phone has one now. Like every right. new phone pretty much has GPS now. It seems like and a, a like with my Android I get full directions with the like it reads the directions and tells you when to turn and everything. Like it's it's um, beyond yeah, what just Google Maps was. Unless the directions that were being fed into our into our mobile devices could change because it seems like the TomToms and Garmin's of the world are not probably going to be selling standalone GPS units for too much longer. Right? right. Cuz every and, smart uh, device TomTom Tom does there. sell an app for the iPhone. Yeah, yeah. But Tom, there's no reason TomTom Tom couldn't utilize but IBM's I guess, technology. I guess, and, well, because the TomTom Tom one costs money, maybe the IBM would, would be free. Mm, maybe. Of course, right now I have the Google one for free. And they just want you to drive by, that's all, right? They just want yeah, you to look at just, their store? Well, if you're driving by, you might be like, oh, hey, I need milk. <laughs> mm, but, that, that, yeah. I don't like it. Well, let's get well, one last political story before we uh, wrap up the roundup. What do you think? Sure. Some of you might have heard about uh, the uh, boycott Wall Street uh, protests that are going on in New York right now. And uh, there also was an incident where um, some people that were um, protesting peacefully were pepper sprayed by uh, some local law enforcement. Now, uh, what's interesting about that is the Internet has responded in a pretty organized attack. And Anonymous, you remember them, they got involved with this as well. And, and by using uh, a still that was taken from TV coverage, they tracked down the police officer who was responsible for pepper spraying the innocent protesters. And, well, you can imagine once they got his badge number and his name where that went, they started, you know, of course, digging out his 
phone number, his previous address, uh, people he's related to, where he works, photos, things like that, and messages. Uh, because uh, oh, and also a lawsuit from uh, 2004 where he was also sued for excessive brutality. Um, it's the second or third time we've had an, an incident recently where the different groups on the internet have sort of gotten together to expose information about a person and go after them. It's mm -hmm. sort of like online vigilantism. What do you think of this? Well, it's exactly what you said. It's vigilantism, and so it's not always good, but at is the same bad? time... I mean, is it, it bad? It can be, uh, but... If somebody is using excessive force and then not being properly punished, and their job is to protect us, and they're and they're not being punished when they don't protect us, shouldn't right. they be held accountable? And and obviously, yes, no one in a but, position of power is holding them accountable. Right. And so, bringing it to media attention and making something happen is good, but you know, just causing harm to the person is not. I agree. I agree. It's not anonymous's place to. To dish and, out punishment. And isn't that really the issue, is by releasing this information, there's no control over what the response will be. It's sort of like just throwing it to the wolves, and, and if somebody wants to be awful, they can be awful. And, and like mm -hmm. Mr. Mango points out in the chat room, is where does it stop? Where does the, vigil where does the vigilantism stop? Yeah. Like, a, a part of well, me... Where does it stop being, you know, activism and start becoming vigilantism, right? Part of me, though, feels like some of these people, maybe not this cop, but some of these people should be held accountable for some of the crap they're doing. For sure. But it's not anonymous's place to deal out punishment, right? They can, yeah, right. They're being, bringing, they're being, it, they're being the doing the investigation and, the and, and bringing it to people's attention is good, but dealing out punishment is, is not yeah. their place. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. And it's, it's interesting. Um, it, right, it's we, really hard to draw the line of, you know, it is because you, you just kind of, activism and what once you've gone too far. You kind of see some of the logic behind it, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right, well, we're going to wrap up the show here, but before we go, it's time to jump into the Bitcoin Blaster, and this is uh, maybe the last Bitcoin Blaster we might have for a little while, unless things kind of heat back up in the Bitcoin space. Mm -hmm. So if, if you have a suggestion of a reoccurring little uh, end-of-the-show segment idea, um, submit it to our uh, links.techsnap.tv Reddit page and have mm -hmm. people vote on it, and maybe we can work in something new to the end of the show here to replace the Bitcoin Blaster. Mm -hmm. All right, but uh, I'll just give you your quick uh, Bitcoin update, and I want to tell you a little bit about something that's uh, hot and heavy this week in the world of Bitcoin, and that's called merged mining. Have you heard of this one, Alan? No, I haven't. What is it? So merged mining is, uh, it lets you work on two totally separate blockchains at the same time by playing both in the Namecoin block and, uh, uh -huh. and, and, doing, and Bitcoin. So you run the Bitcoin miner on your machine, and you run the Namecoin miner on your machine, and then they're able to talk to each other and give each other the results that they come to, and then they can cross-check their own blocks that they're working on. So as the Bitcoin gets an answer, it just shares that number with the Namecoin client, and it checks its block to see if that solves it, and it, vice versa. So you're able to sort of, you know, go. Mm. Mu you're able to rip through a, a blockchain potentially much faster. And you combine that with something like pooled mining, and it gets pretty powerful. Yeah. So, uh, anyways, it's an it's, it's an interesting thing, and it involves changing um, some some of the Bitcoin client technology and things like that. But a link in the show notes if you want to read about that. Also, just a quick mention of, a, of the new Bitcoin 0 0.4.0 client that's been released. This one includes wallet encryption. So, that's a good uh -huh. update. Yeah. Now you have uh, wallet encryption, so go check that out. And then the last thing right, I want to mention... Before this, wallets were plain text files, so if somebody right. stole the wallet file, they would yep. have it. Now it'll be encrypted with a passphrase. Of course, if you lose that passphrase, you've lost your wallet, but... Yes, yes. That's your own fault. Now, uh, I know, I feel you. You know, as the recording of this episode, uh, the Bitcoin is currently valued at 34 million U.S. dollars. That's the market cap. It's down. Bitcoin's seen better days. Yeah. And you might be questioning, should I still be running those Bitcoin mining rigs that use so much power? If only there was something else I could do with them. Well, I might have the answer for you. Check this out. This guy decided to turn his Bitcoin mining rigs into a dehydrator. He's got these, he set up his, I got a video if you're watching the video version here, I've got, he set up his uh, motherboard with his GPUs in his kitchen, and then put plates of fruit behind the uh, heat outlets of the GPUs, and uh, just let it run, for uh, like, he says here in the video, like a couple of days or something like that, pulling 1500 watts, I, uh, I, I might add, but uh, anyways, after it ran for a little bit, uh, two days, he says here, and he also mined a 3.44 Bitcoin while he was de dehydrating them, and 36 kilowatts of electricity, but... Lo and behold, the fruit actually turned out wonderfully uh, dehydrated. So there you go. Or if you're moldy. <laughs> if you're struggling what to do with your Bitcoin miner, maybe you could turn it into a food dehydrator. What do you think, Alan? No? Um, that doesn't look like it was dehydrated quite properly. Well, 
you know, uh, desperate measures and desperate like times, normally a dehydrator is is removing the the moisture and that yeah. is not just blowing what he what he did was basically putting blow, it under a blow dryer. Yeah, blow dryer. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Kind of funny though. I mean, yeah. you know, in, the internet's full of those kinds of things. Yeah. Anything else before we wrap up the show, Alan? Uh, no, I think that's about it. Wow. Well, there you have it. All right, that's, everyone. Uh, good episode. Yeah, I, I love this one, and uh, we'd love for you to join us live, just like everybody in our live chat room. As I mentioned that earlier, at jblive.tv. That's 1 p.m. Pacific. Alan, you want to give him the East Coast time on that one? That's 4 p.m. Good job, Eastern. sir. Look at that. Just right off the top of his head like he already knew the answer. Well, it's because I live in Eastern time, and that's what time I have to do the show every week. Hmm. I thought that <laughs> might be why. Now it all comes together, sir. All right, everyone. Well, TechSnap is available for on-demand, and like I mentioned earlier, audio and uh, various versions of video, including just lately, if everything works out, WebM and Og Theora again. The HTML5 player is back. Yay! In, in limited deployment uh, right Mark. now uh, TechSnap and maybe the Linux Action Show kind of depends because uh, those, those videos take like four hours each to encode un under those formats if you want to get them down because I have, I have very strict standards everyone mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. so go check those out if you haven't watched TechSnap over on our site in a while uh, you might enjoy the new HTML5 player I'd like to hear your feedback and see what you think and of course uh, why not leave a comment where you're over there on that show page and check out the TechSnap Reddit page all kinds of fun to be had all right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of TechSnap, and we'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>